Now, the other day I was flying back from San Francisco to San Diego, and I was sitting next to a priest in the plane, and he asked me, what do I do for a living? And I said, well, I study vision, I study perception, how the brain perceives the world. And he said, well, what's there to study? And I said, well, what do you think goes on in my brain when I look at any object? Dr. Villanueva Ramachandran is one of the world's leading brain scientists. He was born in India, but his fascination with the human mind drew him to Britain to study the brain, and then to the world mecca of neuroscience, San Diego, California, where today he's at the forefront of those tackling one of science's ultimate challenges, the mystery of how the human brain works. In this program, he investigates three bizarre disorders of human vision that take him from the consulting room to the outer limits of brain science. Plum cherry banana. I believe it's a banana. No, 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 it's not banana, no. Philip has a problem with the part of his brain that deals with recognition. Well-known personality... I don't know. There's nothing much wrong with his eyes. It's just that he often doesn't know who or what he is looking at. I don't know. I haven't got a clue. David's vision problem is even stranger than Philip's. Although he recognizes the people he knows, they don't feel familiar to him. This leads him to think that the man who looks like his father is in fact an imposter pretending to be his father. He can look like my father, but the fact is that it doesn't feel like him because I know it's not him. It can look identical to him, exactly like him, but it's not him. When Ramachandran encounters strange stories like these, he is both a doctor, there to help, but also a detective, on the lookout for clues that might explain the brain science behind such weird experiences. So thank you very much for coming by today. Okay? Thank you for having me here. John is epileptic. Frequent seizures in his brain invest everything he looks at with overwhelming significance. Sometimes he even has visions and believes that he is God. I am so blessed. I get to see a glimpse. People say, no, you can't see into the future. Uh-uh. Did you have to, you feel That's what that gift is, man. I see. Okay. That's what that gift is, but you got to pay for it. You got to pay for it by flopping around and getting slammed around. John, Philip and David have all suffered damage to a region of the brain just behind the temples called the temporal lobes. For Ramachandran, disorders of the temporal lobes not only shed light on how the normal brain works, they also enable us to grapple with questions that have puzzled philosophers since the dawn of history. Ultimate questions like, how we come by knowledge of the world? What is it about the particular beauty of a face? And even the question of why we are all prone to religious feelings. But the story begins with the eyes and the very earliest stages of seeing. When I was a medical student, I was taught there's an area in the back of the brain called visual cortex. And that's where seeing takes place. But since then, we have learned, in fact, there's not just one. There are 30 areas in the brain concerned just with seeing. And maybe these different areas are specialized for different aspects of vision. One area for seeing colors, Another area for seeing movement, or form and shape, relative distance and depth. Now, despite this staggering complexity of all these different areas, there seems to be a simple overall pattern of organization. In fact, the visual input as it comes in seems to divide into two parallel streams of processing. There is one pathway which we call the how pathway, to which some of these areas belong, and that how pathway seems to be concerned mainly with navigation, with being able to walk around, avoid bumping into obstacles, be avoiding uneven terrain, reaching out and grabbing something. 
The how pathway leads from the main visual areas to the top of the brain. The other pathway is the what pathway, and this leads from the main visual areas to the temporal lobes. The what pathway is concerned with recognizing the object. What am I looking at? What does it mean for me? Is this an edible object? Is it a flower? Is it a person's face? What is it that I'm looking at, and what does it mean for me? That's what the what pathway is concerned with, and it's that pathway that seems to be damaged in Philip. One of the first things we learn to do is to recognize and name animals. Camel. Camel. They're camels. I'll hazard against the camels. <laughs> Too late, you're off. But if I hadn't seen the signpost, then I wouldn't have known. Last summer, Ramachandran was invited to meet Philip in Cambridge to witness a series of tests. He had a hunch that Philip's naming problem was a key to understanding the brain's recognition system. You know, I'm introducing you to Philip, who I've been working with for several years now. Um, back at the, in the late 70s, he was involved in a very serious car accident, and this left him comatose for a number of weeks. And when he actually came round from the coma, it was noted that he'd got problems in recognizing people's faces and also in recognizing animals and fruit and vegetables. History starts for me after the date of the accident, because as a result of the accident, my memory is very, very short. Okay, now, when you look at, say, an animal, what is your feeling about it? I mean, is it, does it look fuzzy? Does it look out of focus? Or you know what it is, but you can't say it out loud because it's at the tip of your tongue? If I know what it is, but I can't, it's on the tip of my tongue, as you say, but I just can't place it. Although Philip's shattered memory is a severe problem for him, he does manage to lead a relatively normal life. The skin. Now, this difficulty, it's a, it seems to be a relatively isolated difficulty in that he can actually recognise buildings, he doesn't get lost, he drives his way around Cambridge, collects his daughter from school every day. In the first test, Philip is shown pictures of famous buildings, which he seems to take in his stride. That's Cambridge, that's King's College Chapel. He's identified by the bike sitting outside. <laughs> to anybody else, I'm just perfectly normal, because I'm that good at masking over when I'm trying to bluff my way around a situation. I can take you from A to B, no trouble. What's clear is that he's not blind. Absolutely. Um, and this suggests that the notion that vision is one process is clearly wrong. There are all these subtle processes going on in the 30 or odd visual areas that yeah. have been described in the primate brain. And some of these pathways can be selectively damaged. So you get these very, very fascinating deficits where one category alone is affected with other categories being intact. What's this thing? Electric plug. A pair of glasses. Philip is fine with objects. It's with categories of living things that the problems start. See if you can tell me about this one. I know what it is, but I can't name it. Uh -huh. And it's annoying me. Philip's phrase is a bit odd. He says he knows what it is, but he can't name it. But in fact, in most instances, he doesn't even know what it is. This brings us face to face with the mysterious borderland between seeing and knowing, which has always puzzled philosophers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't know it's a rhino, how can you tell if it's a rhino? If the teacher's told you. Well, if you don't know what a rhino is, how do you know what a rhino is? No, but I mean, if the teacher's told you. If you don't know what a rhino is, how do you know what a rhino is? I couldn't have put it better myself. You have just said it all. You've just said it all. 